Let's talk a little bit about the cytoskeleton. This is, as the name implies, the skeleton of the cell. This is a dynamic network. Dynamic meaning that it can change. It's not static. And it's a network, very complex, of protein fibers. So we've talked in the past about proteins that are globular in shape as they fold onto themselves. Um, these filamentous or fibrous proteins tend to be um, longer and they work as, as long stretches. So a dynamic network of protein fibers extending throughout the cytoplasm. Picture, um, picture a spider web. Uh, you know, some spiders form a nice flat two-dimensional orb type spider web. Uh, others, on the other hand, it's more three-dimensional and kind of chaotic. Picture one of those three-dimensional, like a, like a black widow type spider web. So imagine three dimensions of this webbing all throughout, carrying out all these different activities that we're going to talk about. Three main types of these protein fiber, fibers. The first are called microtubules. These are the largest of all of them. They are hollow tubes made up of a protein called tubulin. So imagine these sort of like a straw. Intermediate filaments are intermediate in size, a little bit smaller than the microtubules. They're primarily made of a protein called keratin, so fibrous keratin proteins, and then supercoiled into thick cables, meaning they're twisted around each other, and then those are twisted around one another as well. And then microfilaments, also called actin filaments, and these are just strands of the protein actin that are then wound around one another. Those are the smallest and the thinnest of the three main types of protein fibers that we see in the cytoskeleton. If you look at table 4.1 in your book, you can see some of the similarities and differences of those. So what are the main functions? The first and primary function of the cytoskeleton is structure and support. So like I said, you can picture a, um, a three-dimensional spider web kind of uh, sprawled through the entire cavity of, uh, of a cell, right, throughout the entire cytoplasm, uh, holding things in place and giving the cell some structure and support. That becomes especially important in human and animal cells when you realize that we don't have a cell wall. And so this cytoskeleton gives our cells a little bit of, um, of rigidity and a little bit of resistance against shearing and compression type forces. But we also see that the cytoskeleton is involved in motility. Motility is a fancy word for movement. There's a lot of different movements we're talking about, either the whole cell moving or in some cases, organelles and other structures within the cell moving around uh, but never leaving the cell. So for example, flagella, cilia, pseudopodia, those are examples where the entire cell is moving somewhere. A flagellum is a large whip-like tail. Cilia are small hair-like structures that we find on a variety of cell types that can be coordinated and wave in movement. Think paramecium, for example. And then pseudopodia, classic pseudopodia, are found in the amoeba. Uh, this is where you get cytoplasmic extensions that allows a cell to essentially crawl by pushing portions of itself forward like a, a little foot to grab on ahead of it. Um, I would recommend you find some videos online of, of all three of these, flagella, cilia, and pseudopodia, so you can have a good sense of how these work. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them in a few minutes here, but the bottom line is that it requires a cytoskeleton and a very dynamic cytoskeleton to pull that off. Now muscle cells can contract because of cytoskeletal filaments that are interwoven with one another that like to pull against each other. And as they pull against each other, they contract the entire muscle cell, which can, in coordination, can contract a muscle fiber or a bundle of muscle cells or an entire muscle tissue altogether. Plants use something called cytoplasmic streaming which allows them to keep things mixed within the plant. Plants are sessile meaning they don't move around and so um, molecules, particles can settle within a plant cell and not be distributed evenly. So cytoplasmic streaming, which is essentially like muscle cell contraction, but on the inside of a plant cell, can cause uh, the, the liquid of the cytosol to rotate around and keep things well mixed. Um, organelles can be moved and relocated through cytoskeletal interactions. And then we're all familiar with what happens in mitosis and meiosis as the cytoskeleton 
temporarily rearranges itself to form the spindle apparatus, and its sole job is to make sure that replicated chromosomes get separated to the different poles, and so each daughter cell gets a, a, full, um, a full set of the genome. So let's look at a few of these functions here briefly. Let's start with microtubules. Uh, tubulin likes to dimerize, and then it rotates into a circle. So if you look at the diagram here, you can see about 25 nanometers across, and it's hollow. It forms a hollow tube like a straw. How does that work? Imagine if I gave you a coil of rope, and I said to make a tube out of it. You could coil the rope onto itself patiently, persistently, until you built up a tube. That's what tubulin does. It rotates and wraps essentially uh, along an axis to create a hollow tube. In engineering, we've known for, for centuries that tubes, that, that tube shape resists, um, re resists compression forces better than any other shape. So tubulin for sure and, and these microtubules uh, for sure are involved in, uh, in resisting compression, in holding the shape of a cell and keeping it supported. If you're thinking, well, why would a cell get crushed? Just move. You move for a minute, and you're putting a lot of force on a lot of cells as you do that. And without cytoskeleton, some of those cells would rupture in one form or another. Microtubules are used as monorails for organelles. Um, organelles can have small motor pro proteins associated with them that grab onto tubulin and change their shape in like a walking type pattern using some energy source like ATP for the organelles to be able to move. This, in fact, is how vesicles uh, that move from, say, the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi or from the Golgi to the plasma membrane, that's how they find their direction. They don't just wander and diffuse. They actually expend energy to kind of walk along uh, these monorails of microtubules. We talked about separating mitotic chromosomes. Turns out tubules are the essential form of, um, of uh, cytoskeletal fibers for moving chromosomes around during mitosis and meiosis. Centrosomes and centrioles, we'll talk more about those when we talk mitosis and meiosis, but they are kind of organizing centers essentially for chromosomes and for the, um, for the, the mitotic apparatus, the spindle apparatus. Cilia and flagella are largely microtubules, and they have a feature, these microtubules, called dynamic instability, meaning that tubulin can polymerize and depolymerize these microtubules very rapidly, depending on how they can get modified, usually a phosphorylation, dephosphorylation type switch. And so microtubules can be built very quickly, and then they can be depolymerized and taken apart again very quickly. And that becomes important for certain forms of uh, movement, for example. Here's that monorail concept I was just talking about. Imagine a, a vesicle, a great big a um, membrane-bound sac that's carrying some kind of cargo, and attached to it, it has some motor proteins. This drawing is way out of proportion. The motor proteins would be pretty much invisible relative to the vesicle, and the vesicle would be massive compared to this microtubule. But you've got these motor proteins that will, in this case, burn ATP and cause a change or a shift in the shape of the protein at the expense of ATP. So ATP provides some energy, the protein shifts in shape, it's like it's taking a step forward. And then when the phosphate group from the ATP that was added to the protein to change its shape gets removed, it returns to its normal shape, but by so doing it causes the rest of the motor protein to scoot forward. And so essentially at the, at the expense of ATP, these motor proteins can literally walk down microtubules of the cytoskeleton. If you look at your textbook, uh, figure 410, you'll see uh, um, a pretty good explanation of this. And you can find some good videos online that can maybe animate this for you and help you to see how this is moving. Cilia and flagella, this is another one that's tough to explain two-dimensionally, so I recommend you try to find some animations online. Bottom line is that cilia and flagella are movement-like structures that are actually still in the cytoplasm, even though they look like they're outside of it. The cytoplasmic or plasma membrane is never breached by these. It, it continues to coat them entirely, like you can see in this diagram here of a typical cilium, and the flagellum is very similar as well. If you do a cross-section, you can find this 9 plus 2 arrangement that, uh, that you read about, where you have a series of uh, microtubules in doublets, so long straws going up and down the axis of the cilium. 
you've sliced into them they look like little um, little diplo circles there's a central pair of microtubules in the middle and as you get closer to the uh, the main body of the cell you pick up an extra microtubule and you can see in the cross section a little deeper it says triplet microtubules that's what anchors the doublet microtubules into microtubules that are originating in the cytoplasm so it kind of locks them in and they have those dynein arms. They have these motor proteins like you saw on the last slide. Um, they've got these motor proteins that are grabbing each other. And as those motor proteins are activated, because the dynein arms can't actually go anywhere, pardon me, the, the microtubules can't actually go anywhere, one microtubule doublet tries climbing up, if you will, the next microtubule doublet. But there's really nowhere to go. So it causes the entire structure to bend. And then if they all release and the next microtubule doublet starts climbing up the next one, then it bends a little bit in that direction until pretty soon you're bending in a circular motion. So in a circular motion, you're going to have flagellar movement. Cilia, on the other hand, tend to wave from side to side, where all the microtubules on one side try climbing up each other all at once, and all it does is bend the cilium in that direction, and then they release, and they can potentially go the opposite direction depending on how that cilium functions. Again, tough to describe with a two-dimensional picture. I recommend you find some animations online uh, to get a, a little better visual on how, how these microtubules interact with motor proteins in order, to, um, in order to cause movement in the form of cilia waving or flagella rotating. So those are the microtubules, the intermediate filaments. These are intermediate in size, um, only 8 to 12 nanometers in diameter. Keratin is really common, but you can also find a couple other proteins like desmin and lamin, depending on the type of cell. These are real important in bearing tension, so stretching type forces on the cell. These are much less dynamic, tend to be more permanent. Once they're in the cell, they tend to stay there help retain that cell shape. Also, in some cases, help to hold certain organelles right where they belong. And then inside the nucleus, if you've ever noticed any picture you see of a nucleus, that big membrane-bound organelle remains perfectly spherical, like this giant Death Star just sitting there. How is that possible if it's just made of this, this phospholipid bilayer? Well, there's a nuclear lamina of lamin and other proteins, intermediate filaments, that line the inside of that sphere and help to keep its shape so that it doesn't collapse, which would threaten the, the safety and security of the DNA that's inside. That's the purpose of the nucleus, protect the DNA. That nuclear lamina gives it some rigidity uh, to make sure that it doesn't crush or collapse under any sort of pressure. And then finally, the microfilaments. These are the smallest. They're sometimes called actin filaments because actin is the protein that is polymerized into a single strand, and then two of those actin strands are twisted around each other like you see in the picture here. They form a, a width or diameter of about 7 nanometers, so these are the smallest. They can be linear. They can be branched. They can be highly dynamic, meaning they can polymerize and depolymerize pretty quickly. Sort of like the intermediate filaments, they're involved in bearing tension for a cell. Very important for muscle cell contraction because we get actin fibers that also uh, that are, are interleaved with, um, with motor proteins called myosin. So you get these actin-myosin interactions. And what it really causes is these, uh, these actin, the, the myosin motor proteins cause the actin fibers to draw into each other, causing them to contract. Uh, again, hard to sort of describe two-dimensionally. Find a good video that maybe has that animated for you. Um, so important in muscle cell contraction and amoeboid movement, as well as in cytoplasmic streaming in plants. Um, here's a slide that shows a little bit of that actin-myosin interactions. In the, the top diagram, you got a, a muscle cell that's kind of a large tube-like structure. And you have these repeating um, subunits, essentially, that are made up of actin filaments and then myosin filaments, or myosin arms. And the actin filaments um, can't go anywhere except towards each other. So the myosin filaments, these myosin arms, you see these purple guys here. I'll see if my pointer will show up. Right? These here on the left are going to attempt walking to the left. These on the right are going to attempt walking to the right. And since they're all connected, they can't go in two different directions. So instead of 
them tearing apart, they're going to draw these two separate filaments towards each other. So try to picture that. Maybe put your fingers up and interleave your fingers and imagine these uh, drawing together because of the action of the actin and myosin coming together. So the myosin is the motor protein. It's going to require energy in the form of ATP. Actin is the microfilament that's running all down the length of these muscle cells and will cause the cell itself to contract. We see the same thing happening in uh, down here in amoeboid movement where you get actin-myosin interactions at one end of the cell causing contraction which forces all of the cytoplasm into one area and that pushes against the, the cytoplasmic membrane creating this false foot, this pseudopod and it allows the cell to extend sort of like it's walking or taking a step. And down here, cytoplasmic streaming, same idea. Actin and myosin located all the way around here. And as they contract, if they contract here, they squeeze the water and then release here and contract here and squeeze the water. And they can contract in a, a, um, a rhythmic pattern. So in sequence, starting the contraction here and continuing all the way around, essentially chasing the cytoplasm around in a circle so that things stay nice and mixed inside there. That's a good place to stop this video. Um, I hope that was a little bit helpful, especially if you've got your textbook out sitting next to you. If you have questions, by all means, let me know. I'll do what I can. And if you find any good um, animations online for some of these. Shoot them my way and I can share them with the rest of the class.